somebody made that dramatic little video. And I've always liked it. So good morning, Alexandra, Julian, Shay. So the origins of eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells evolved their features in two different ways. The infolding of the plasma membrane of a prokaryotic cell to form the endomembrane system. And endosymbiosis. Symbiosis is a general association between organisms of two or more species. Endosymbiosis refers to one species just living inside the other one. And scientists believe this is the process by which eukaryotes gained mitochondria and chloroplasts. Mitochondria and chloroplasts used to be their own little organisms. Somehow they got into prokaryotic cells and they started living together. And then when we started reproducing those cells, or when those cells started reproducing themselves, they didn't just reproduce their own DNA or RNA, they also reproduced the mitochondria or chloroplasts that they absorbed, which was called something else way back then, but that's what we call it now. There's three lines of evidence that support the theory of endosymbiosis. Both chloroplasts and mitochondria have double membranes from endocytosis. They also have circular DNA like prokaryotes. Chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own set of DNA. And then there are prokaryotic ribosomes. <laughs> What if you could absorb another organism and take on its abilities? Imagine you swallowed a small bird and suddenly gained the ability to fly. Or if you engulfed a cobra and were then able to spit poisonous venom from your teeth. Throughout the history of life, specifically during the evolution of complex eukaryotic cells, things like this happened all the time. One organism absorbed another and they united to become a new organism with the combined abilities of both. We think that around 2 billion years ago, the only living organisms on Earth were prokaryotes, single-celled organisms lacking membrane-bound organelles. Let's look closely at just three of them. One was a big, simple, blob-like cell with the ability to absorb things by wrapping its cell membrane around them. Another was a bacterial cell that converted solar energy into sugar molecules through photosynthesis. A third used oxygen gas to break down materials like sugar and release its energy into a form useful for life activities. The blob cells would occasionally absorb the little photosynthetic bacteria. These bacteria then lived inside the blob and divided like they always had but their existence became linked. If you stumbled upon this living arrangement, you might just think that the whole thing was one organism, that the green photosynthetic bacteria were just a part of the blob that performed one of its life functions, just like your heart is a part of you that performs the function of pumping your blood. This process of cells living together is called endosymbiosis, one organism living inside another. But the endosymbiosis didn't stop there. What would happen if the other bacteria moved in too? Now the cells of this species started becoming highly complex. They were big and full of intricate structures that we call chloroplasts and mitochondria. These structures worked together to harness sunlight, make sugar, and break down that sugar using the oxygen that right around this time started to appear in the Earth's atmosphere. Organisms absorbing other organisms was one way species adapted to the changing environmental conditions of their surroundings. This little story highlights what biologists call the endosymbiotic theory, the current best explanation of how complex cells evolved. There's a lot of evidence that supports this theory, but let's look at three main pieces. First, the chloroplasts and mitochondria in our cells multiply the very same way as those ancient bacteria, which are still around, by the way. 
In fact, if you destroy these structures in a cell, no new ones will appear. The cell can't make them. They can only make more of themselves. Second piece of evidence. Chloroplasts and mitochondria both contain their own DNA and ribosomes. Their DNA has a circular structure that is strikingly similar to the DNA of the ancient bacteria, and it also contains many similar genes. The ribosomes, or protein assembly machines, of chloroplasts and mitochondria also have the same structure as ribosomes of ancient bacteria, but are different from the ribosomes hanging around the rest of the eukaryotic cell. Lastly, think about the membranes involved in the engulfing process. Chloroplasts and mitochondria both have two membranes surrounding them, an inner and outer membrane. Their inner membrane contains some particular lipids and proteins that are not present in the outer membrane. Why is that significant? Because their outer membrane used to belong to the blob cell. When they were engulfed in the endosymbiosis process, they got wrapped up in that membrane and kept their own as their inner one. Surely enough, those same lipids and proteins are found on the membranes of the ancient bacteria. Biologists now use this theory to explain the origin of the vast variety of eukaryotic organisms. Take the green algae that grow on the walls of swimming pools. A larger eukaryotic cell with spinning tail structures, or flagella, at some point absorbed algae like these to form what we now call euglena. Euglena can perform photosynthesis, break down sugar using oxygen, and swim around pond water. And as the theory would predict, the chloroplasts in these euglena have three membranes, since they had two before being engulfed. The absorbing process of endosymbiotic theory allowed organisms to combine powerful abilities to become better adapted to life on Earth. The results were species capable of much more than when they were separate organisms. And this was an evolutionary leap that led to the microorganisms, plants, and animals we observe on the planet today. That is the endosymbiotic theory and the evidence scientists have found to support it. So the simplest definition of a protist is eukaryotes that are not plants, they're not animal, and they're not fungus. So they don't actually have their own definition. We just know what they're not. Protists obtain their nutrition in a variety of ways. Algae are autotrophs. We call them plant-like protists. They're not plants, but they're plant-like because they can do photosynthesis. Parasites derive their nutrition from a living host, which is harmed by the interaction. So they are heterotrophs. And protists that live primarily by ingesting food are called protozoans. And protozoans with flagella are called flagellates. We will go over examples of all of these. There are plant-like protists, animal-like protists that are heterotrophs, and then there are fungus-like protists. And there's examples of each, an autotroph, which is an algae, a heterotroph, a parasitic trypanosome, which is the little purple squiggly thing that lives in humans. Humans are their host and they feed off the red blood cells. And then a mixotroph, he was talking about in the video, the euglena can do both. They can eat their food or they can do photosynthesis. Habitats are diverse. They include oceans, lakes, ponds, damp soil, leaf litter, and the bodies of host organisms with, with which they share mutually beneficial relationships, such as unicellular algae and reef building corals and cellulose digesting protists and termites. The one important thing protists need is water. At this point in time, two billion years ago when protists evolved, their life was still tied to the water. And then here's more examples of flagellate. Remember, that's a protist with a flagella. 
Giardia, Trichomonas, an amoeba, a foram, an AP complexin, and a ciliate. Ciliates just mean they have cilia, and that's how they move. So protozoan, an amoeba is a type of protozoan. They're characterized by great flexibility in their body shape and the absence of permanent organelles for locomotion. So they don't have cilia, they don't have flagella. They kind of just form their body around whatever they want. You can see in the picture, the amoeba is trying to capture whatever that other little organism is, probably to absorb and eat it. But most species move and feed by means of pseudopodia. Pseudo means fake. Podia means feet. So they have fake feet. They just extend their cytoplasm around whatever they want and bring it in. They're temporary extensions of the cell. AP complexins are a type of protozoa. They're named for a structure at their apex or tip that is specialized for penetrating host cells and tissues. They are all parasitic, they harm their hosts. And they're able to cause serious human diseases such as malaria, which is caused by plasmodium. So the picture on the left is a lot of AP complexins together and you can see they have kind of a point at their tip that's their structure they use for penetrating host cells and tissues. And on the right, the little purple blobs are plasmodium. So people with malaria, if you look at their blood, you will find these little protozoans in there, these little protists. Ciliates are protozoans that are named for their use of hair-like structures called cilia to sweep food into their mouths. They're mostly free living. They're not parasites, they don't need a host. And in the picture is a paramecium. And you can see the little kind of wave-like structures all over it that are helping it move. Those are the cilia. So its specific name is paramecium, but as a category, it's called a ciliate because it has cilia and that's how it moves. And it's a protozoan because it's a heterotroph and it actually eats its food. And a protozoan is a type of protist. So there's different levels and categories to these organisms. Slime molds. I don't know why I find slime molds absolutely fascinating. And if we were in class, we would be actually growing them in Petri dishes. But they resemble fungi in appearance and lifestyle due to convergence, but they are more closely related to amoebas. The two main groups are plasmodial slime molds and cellular slime molds. So those are slime molds. Plasmodial slime molds are named for the feeding stage in their life cycle, which, an amoeb which is an amoeboid mass called a plasmodium. Amoeboid means it kind of acts like an amoeba, but that's not what it is. Um, they are decomposers on forest floors. They can be very, very large, as you saw in the video. As long as there is food, they, were, they will keep spreading everywhere. And then cellular slime molds have an interesting complex life cycle of successive stages. The feeding stage of the solitary amoeboid cells, and then a swarming stage as a slug-like colony that can move and function as a single unit. And then they have a stage during which they generate stalk-like multicellular reproductive structures. That's what they showed at the end of the video. That's how they reproduce and they pop and release their spores. And scientists don't know much about slime molds. They don't know when they do this. They don't know why or what signal they give each other to start reproducing or to start gathering into that swarming stage. They just somehow know when to do it.
Algae are photosynthetic protists, which support entire food chains in both freshwater and marine ecosystems. Many unicellular algae are components of plankton, the communities of mostly microscopic organisms that drift or swim weakly in aquatic environments. And phytoplankton are arguably, arguably the most important life. Thanks to the Earth. Monterey Bay Aquarium for partnering with us on this episode of SciShow. They hope you have a plankton of fun watching. Right now, there are incredible creatures in the ocean with the power to reshape the planet's atmosphere. After all, they've done it before, and you've probably never even seen them unless you've looked at seawater under a microscope. I'm talking, of course, about phytoplankton, the microscopic critters that almost all life in the oceans and arguably on land depends on. Phytoplankton is a catch-all category for all all the tiny aquatic organisms that can turn sunlight into food via photosynthesis. And there are all kinds of different organisms included in it, from cyanobacteria to whip-tailed dinoflagellates to armored diatoms, which look amazing under a microscope, by the way. Diatoms are essentially algae that build little houses out of glass or silica, to be precise, and they come in a stunning diversity of forms. In fact, if you've ever spread diatomaceous earth around your garden or your house, you were sprinkling fossilized diatoms. There are also coccolithophores, which can look kind of like a soccer ball covered in frisbees, thanks to their teeny tiny shells made of calcium carbonate. In fact, England's famous white cliffs of Dover contain the fossilized remains of countless coccolithophores. And in today's ocean, the smelly compounds they produce help give the sea its unmistakable scent, a smell birds like albatrosses use to find their meals. The Compounds that make those smells can also travel up high into the atmosphere to help clouds form and grow, making them more reflective and helping to keep us down here a lot cooler. And dinoflagellates are also very cool, don't want to leave them out. They have two tail-like flagella that help them swim around, and many can produce their own light, which makes for some really magical effects. But too many of them in one place can create a harmful algal bloom, a phenomenon you might have heard referred to as red tide, which is just one example of how these super teeny creatures can have a big impact on the rest of us, even us landlubbers. No matter what form phytoplankton take, they are unbelievably important to all life on Earth. First off, they're the foundation of the marine food web, underpinning everything from anchovies to whales. In fact, with a wee bit of help from seaweed and aquatic plants, they manage to support life in the ocean despite being outweighed by roughly five to one by organisms that don't make their own food. And if that's not enough, they are also atmosphere-altering machines. They consume about as much carbon dioxide as all of the world's forests and other plants combined, pulling roughly 11 gigatons of carbon from our atmosphere every year, which is especially impressive when you consider that by mass, there's about 450 times as much plant life on land. Plus, phytoplankton account for more than half of the planet's yearly oxygen production. But even more importantly, they're kind of the reason we have oxygen in the atmosphere at all. Back about 2.5 billion years ago, near the boundary between the Archean and the Proterozoic eons, the Earth was a very different place. There were green seas and orange skies, and the atmosphere was likely a mix of gases like ammonia and methane that would immediately kill us. Then cyanobacteria evolved and ran rampant, pumping out a huge amount of oxygen in what's now called the Great Oxidation Event. All that oxygen helped turn the ocean and skies blue and likely jump-started the evolution of complex life. And then around 540 million years ago, phytoplankton did it again, exploding in numbers and bringing us up to more or less the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere we have today. Paleontologists think the boom may have occurred thanks to nutrients weathered out of rocks by giant continent-sized glaciers. Or a more recent idea is that it happened because the plankton evolved a more efficient internal machinery related to photosynthesis. Either way, this set the stage for life to fully spread throughout the ocean and onto the land. Since then, they've calmed down on the reshaping the entire planet front and adopted more of a stabilizing role. For example, paleontologists think the evolution of calcifying 
plankton balanced ocean chemistry and helped protect the seas from mass extinction. So for about 80 million years ago, the ocean was not a super stable place to be. Changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere from events like volcanic eruptions often caused deadly swings in seawater pH. Then some lineages of plankton, including those ball-like coccolithophores, figured out how to make shells of calcium carbonate. Soon, they took over the open ocean. And over a relatively short period of time, so many of their shells sank to the depths of the oceans that they created a vast, thick layer of calcium carbonate ooze on the seafloor. That ooze acts as a chemical buffer in the ocean, a natural breaking system on runaway acidity. See, the shells are solid at a more neutral pH, but as the water gets more acidic, they start to dissolve, releasing carbonate ions. Those chemically react with the surrounding seawater to push an acidic pH back towards neutral. Now, there had been a minor version of this in the shallows, thanks to mollusks and other large-shelled organisms, but it took phytoplankton to make it ocean-wide. And the end result was a more stable ocean chemistry, which meant marine life became less vulnerable to things like volcanic eruptions. Even today, this chalk layer is helping buffer the acidifying effects of all the carbon dioxide that we humans are pumping into the atmosphere. No, there's only so much it can do. When we consider everything that lives in the ocean from majestic whales to bountiful coral reefs, these little unassuming phytoplankton are easy to overlook. But if you look at the history of Earth, it doesn't take long to realize that though they are small, they are also mighty. And they deserve as much fascination, love, and protection as any other living thing on this planet. Thank you again to the Monterey Bay Aquarium for partnering with us on this episode of SciShow. The aquarium's mission is to inspire conservation of the ocean, so give them a follow on their social media accounts. Thanks to the Monterey Bay Aquarium for partnering with us on this episode of SciShow. All right, that is the importance of phytoplankton. So there's all different kinds of algae, like he was saying. There's dinoflagellates with two beating flagella and external plates made of cellulose. Cellulose is the sugar made by most plants. There's diatoms with glassy cell walls containing silica. And there's regular green algae. When you think of algae, the green algae is probably what you picture. You're gonna see all of these in your lab. The green algae are unicellular in most freshwater lakes and ponds. Sometimes they have flagella, sometimes they're flagellated. Climbing Demonis on the left is an example of a green algae with a pair of flagella. Sometimes they're colonial, forming a hollow ball of flagellated cells. On the right, that is called volvox. Colonial means they just, they live in a colony. They don't live by themselves. They need, they need friends and family to help them through. Seaweed. This is one of the only algae and protists in general that you can actually see with your eyes. You don't need a microscope for it. Everybody's seen this. Everybody's been to the beach. Actually, I don't know that, but I'm assuming everybody's been to the beach um, because we live so close to the coast. But these are large multicellular marine algae. They grow on or near rocky shores. They're similar to plants because of convergent evolution, but they are more closely related to unicellular algae and they are often edible. If you've ever had sushi, you've eaten seaweed. And now they pair them as snacks. My kids love seaweed. But the seaweed that you find as you walk along the beach, those are not plants, those are protists. The seaweeds are classified into three different groups based on their pigments. They're very easy to remember. Green algae has a green pigment. Red algae has a red pigment. Brown algae, which include the kelp, the big seaweed forests, 
have a brown pigment. And there's huge kelp forests off the coast of California. He mentioned the Monterey Bay Aquarium. There's a huge kelp forest that a lot of marine biologists come to study. The kelp forests and the animals that live within it. 